You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. What's up, guys? Welcome into Good Morning Lambo. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. I'm joined alongside Tim live in Green Bay. And we're here just on a uh, a beautiful Monday morning, ready to talk a little Green Bay Packers. Obviously, the Packers dropped a tough game uh, yesterday in Pittsburgh. And, um, you know, these are the growing pains we talk about, right? We, we're saying it every week. You get so close, you get within one score winning a ball game. And when you're the youngest team in the league, you're lacking a little bit of veteran presence. You're gonna it's gonna be hard to pull those games out. There's no doubt about it, especially going up against a head coach like Mike Tomlin and all the things he does well. I thought Tomlin put together a great game plan, um, and uh, I thought you know I thought our coaching staff did pretty decent too. The run defense obviously broke, and that's been kind of the uh, the reoccurring theme all year. Um, but with that being said, um, I think we come away with some things that we can build off of. There's no doubt about that. And again. When you look at how this defense is built and, um, you know, the the emphasis we put on pass rush as opposed to, you know, just the overall uh, defensive play as far as, you know, run defense, it can get tough, man. It can get tough. But, Tim, how you doing this morning, buddy? Doing good. Getting some coffee in me. Um, it's not a victory Monday, but uh, good morning, Lambo. We're here. We're going to break it down. Um, it's not all bad, like you said, right? We got some positives to look at here and uh, happy to be here, Clayton. Let's get the week started, right? Heck yeah. And I just want to go ahead and forewarn everyone. I've got uh, little Miss Etta and uh, Lincoln in here with me this morning. So if you hear a bark, I'll be quick on the mute button. I apologize in advance. But they're uh, they're hanging out up here in the studio with me today. So uh, they're being pretty lazy right now. I think they're still a little depressed from the outcome yesterday. They felt <laughs> it too. So. Um, Omar in the chat says, uh, your boy Rudy was a star yesterday. Uh, again, Clayton. Isaiah McDuffie, another good game, subbing for Quay. Secondary strong again, but what what good is that if they can run the ball down your throat every week? Exactly, man. There was a lot of missed tackles. And I know you you said Rudy was a star yesterday. I think he led the team in tackles, if I remember correctly. But the problem with that is I've seen a bunch of negative plays for Rudy as well. I've seen a couple of times he was out of place schematically. And again, not watching the All-22 just in real time and going, who was that? Rewinding it. And, yep, that was Rudy. Um, missed a few tackles, too, even though he had a lot of tackles, right? But when you run the ball – that effective and you get that many carries there's probably going to be you know an opportunity to have 10 plus tackles but also an opportunity to miss a lot of tackles as well but good to see you in here Omer I know we got a packed house let's see we got a super chat from Josh Martin says as bad as yesterday was at least we ain't the Jets with Zach Wilson them fans are in full meltdown worse than the Bears after week one loss to us go pack go yeah they lose last night also yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. Wow. It seemed like Zach had another bad game. I didn't watch the game, haven't looked at the stats, but just following Twitter, it seemed like the same old, same old, <laughs> Tim. And it's why it's important, man, that you got to get this quarterback thing right. You know, and I know they went out and got Aaron. They invested all up, you know, that that second round pick. They invest the money, especially long term, in the in the son and Aaron Rodgers, and he's hurt and not on the field. So you got to give them credit for doing what they needed to do to try to try to go for a run here. Um, but when you see Zach Wilson as your starting quarterback, and he was a top what top three pick, top five pick, it just goes to show you that's not a slam dunk when you draft up there. Um, but when you go to draft a quarterback that high, Tim, you better get it right, man. Well, and you better put at least somewhat of an offensive line in front of him too. Bingo. Great point. That, you know, one could say that that's a big reason Aaron Rodgers isn't playing football right now. Uh <laughs> Um, and uh, a reason that a quarterback like Zach Wilson uh, is struggling, you know, 
at least when it comes to our lackadaisical offensive line, we get some pass pro out of them. You know, it seems like that Jets offensive line isn't doing run blocking or pass pro very well. And it's, it's showing. Um, so yeah, yeah. quarterback's important, but uh, so, so are the other 10 guys on the field sometimes too, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly correct. Uh, Josh Martin, thank you so much for the super chat, buddy. We appreciate you. Uh, let's see. Red Mo in the chat said, does 200 yards rushing happen uh, due to great blocking by Steelers or personnel decision by Joe Barry? My dad, my dad could back a semi through uh, some of those running lanes. Yeah, no, there were some big, some big holes to run through. Um, I haven't looked at the tape yet. I got lazy yesterday. Um, I say lazy. We did two shows yesterday, but the shows, the multiple shows a day, Tim, are cutting into some of the tape time. Yeah. But uh, that's all right. It's give and take. Um, yeah. At first glance, it seemed like there were some big holes, but there were also a lot of missed tackles. So just kind of on the surface, I'm thinking when I look at the tape, and I try not to have a predetermined, you know, uh, view on what happened without watching the all 22 in the box scan. But it kind of felt like the holes were big to run through, but also there was a lot of missed tackles. So probably going to be about 50-50 on my part. You know, you guys have seen all year long, I'm watching the run defense, and I'm going, man, people are in position to make a play here. They're, they're playing with a loaded box right now, all those things. Um, this one kind of felt like there were some big holes to run through. So you'll probably hear me criticize Joe Barry more than I normally do as far as that goes. But, again, we got to look at the pre-snap alignment. On the surface, Tim, what do you – what kind of sticks out to you there with that with that comment there? What did it kind of feel like to you watching it live? Well, that that's what I saw too, and that's you know before we jumped on on the post game yesterday, I had to had to take a little walk outside and kind of catch my breath because I was <laughs> I was I was I was heated, man. I'm yeah. gonna be honest, I was heated, and uh, you know, 200 plus yards on the ground is gonna gonna kill any chance you have at winning a game mm -hmm. um, through some some unbelievable grit and determination. We found ourselves still in that game. Um, I often wonder if uh, the defense gave up half the yardage they gave, what, what kind of situation we'd be in, but you know what, Clayton, it's not all scheme. It does come down to execution on the defensive side of the ball. Um, you know, I have to kind of walk back some of my comments as we, you know, we were talking about Rudy Ford a few minutes ago. I was pretty high on Keyshawn Nixon yesterday and, um, I still am. I think he's not, um, you know, we had some questions about him in the slot. I feel like he's serviceable as a slot corner, um, not a liability, but man, did I see some missed tackles from Keyshawn yesterday too. And yeah. A lot of that was in the run, run fits in the run game. So, you know, here's the thing, like you said, Clayton, you can't have it both ways, right? right. You just can't, you're not going to, you're not going to have a smothering run defense and a killer killer secondary approach You're, there's going to be some compromise either way I think what we're looking for as fans is to not get run over for 205 yards on the ground you know yeah. we're, we're looking at uh, at least a containment of a run game uh, limiting these gains which they did at times but not consistently and that's what's killing us yeah and you can see on the tape I watched like a three-game saturation of the Steelers they run a lot of that read and ride right, where they're kind of – or ride and read, however you want to word it, where they're out of the gun, they're kind of putting the ball in the belly of the running back, reading the defense, and then deciding the next move. Um, you know, it was just one of those situations where uh, they were a better team. I mean, again, I when I look at the run defense, you know, think of this too, not even the run defense. Think of the play where Kenny Pickett there toward the end of the game scrambled for 11 yards on third down. If you'll go watch that tape, you'll see Rashawn Gary rushes upfield, right, and, and I'm sure they were told, hey, third and long, pin your ears back and go, right? You could tell Devontae Wyatt's responsibility was to engage and then kind of lay back. And you'll notice he lays back, gets his hips flipped to the inside, Kenny runs behind him. The goal there was let's rush up the field, engage, kind of fade back a little bit, and almost run like a little bit of a spy, like not necessarily a drop back spy, but occupy the offensive line so you get your single, your uh, your one on one on the outside with Gary, and then be ready when he <clears throat> flushes out of the uh, pocket right. to hit him. And you see Devontae White just get completely irresponsible, right? And it's why I'm not big on Devontae White, guys. He, I was so excited when they drafted him. He was my top pick. So don't sit here and please don't think I'm sitting here going, oh, these guys don't know what they're doing picking. I was, I was as excited for him as anyone. But the thing that's not developed, and you can see it all the way across the defense, what's the big negative? The negative is constantly missed tackles, right, and our run defense, right? 
So when you look at it, that they're not developing for that. They're putting so much emphasis on the pass rush, and and you're going to come across teams like Pittsburgh, P- teams like Tennessee. You know these run heavy teams where if all you're overly concerned about is stopping the pass and getting after the quarterback, you're going to give up a lot of yardage on the ground. And and what's crazy too, Tim, when you looked at the box score, we the defense only gave up six points in the second half, right? Now, granted, they gave up 17 in the first half, but they really hunkered down and made a great adjustment after halftime. That's one positive I came away with. But at the end of the day, man, you give your offense two shots to go down the field and win the game in the fourth quarter. What else What else can you ask from them? You know what I mean? Um, and, again, the shot play there, the the uh, some of the explosive plays came against man coverage, right? Um, you've seen that on the outside, the back shoulder throw on Valentine. But, uh, yeah, good stuff, man. Um, again, it's a tough loss, but – to, like you said, Tim, 200 yards rushing, inexcusable. Can't happen. Matt LaFleur said it in the presser, too. Like, yeah, we this can't happen. Like, I'm, yeah, and he, he also said something that, that uh, my best friend, man, Tony, he was in the chat last night, mm-hmm. and he was texting me during the game, and he hit it right on the head. He was like, man, too many field goals. I don't like this. There's too many field goals. And then we get Coach LaFleur in the, in the postgame presser, and it's like the second or third words out of his mouth. They're like, yeah, we were just kicking too many field goals there. Right. When we needed touchdowns, and it's like there's another, another factor when it comes to execution. You know what I mean? Some of these drives, man, you finish these plays. We're not, we're not worrying about kicking field goals. We got another set of downs, and we're going to go in the end zone. Mm-hmm. You know, there, this was a, there were plenty of opportunities for us to win this game, and you know, I think we blew it on both sides of the ball. Really, it's not, it's kind of tough to put it on, you know, one side. Yeah. I think this was a, this was a team loss. Like I always say, you win and lose as a team. Um, but certainly the the 200 yards rushing definitely definitely killed us. Oh, it's brutal, man. Absolutely brutal. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Doug in the chat, member of the PTA posse, says, kind of feeling this season is what we signed up for. Knew it was coming, but having having trouble uh, winning with the win loss record. Like I like the direction J Love is headed. You know, I do too, and and here Romero kind of says the same thing. Doug, he says, question, is Jordan Love looking a little better? I think he is. I think he is. If you if you remove that interception at the end of the game, and, and listen, I understand, the most important play of the game was on second and whatever it was, second and ten, second and nine, he tried to throw deep to Watson, forcing it to Watson again. And you're hearing a lot of hate on Watson. We'll talk about him in a little bit. Guys, the interceptions, and I'll, I'll talk about a, a Rob Domofsky tweet, but – the interceptions that are thrown when targeting Christian Watson, I'm sorry, you can't blame those on Christian Watson. I, I seen somebody earlier on Twitter, they were, you know, another drop by Watson leads to a pick. And I'm sitting there going, dude, what are you talking about? He threw the ball into coverage. He threw it late in the back of the end zone, right? And he underthrew it to where they could get a, a hand on it. And any time a ball gets tipped by a corner and another defender picks it off, I'm sorry, you're throwing into coverage. That's just – that, to me, that's common sense. And, again, people can fan how they want. I don't, I never comment on people's opinions on Twitter. I don't think it's right to jump in, oh, you're stupid for thinking that. No, people have the right to think what they want, but that's definitely the way I see it. Now, as far as is he getting a little better, I think he is. I've got a couple clips here. Um, the two touchdown passes, guys, absolute dots. I mean dots. And uh, let's go to the first one here. There may be sound, so I apologize if it's loud. This first one, there is no sound. I know that. But this is the uh, touchdown pass to Jaden Reed right here. Drops back, looks, settles into the pocket. Look at his throw. Great job by Jaden Reed. Jaden Reed's a baller, guys. I'm just telling yeah. you. The, the and that's a great example of what we talked about the other day, too, with uh, throw it to where he's supposed to be, not, yeah. not where he is. And he laid that ball out perfectly. Yep, and, and you could tell he was a little cautious about not wanting to overthrow him, right? Mm-hmm. But Jaden Reed does such a good job. He did this at Michigan State so well. Notice how he slows down, gets in position where the defender cannot make a play on the ball and uh, just secures it. He's, he's a great player. There's no doubt in my mind. You take a look at Jay Love there, too, real quick, right? There looks slightly off platform, but it's not. That left foot is buried in the turf. Yep. You know, he's got, he's got his legs under him, little hitch, little – Little hitch and a twist and let her rip. And this is what we were talking about. There was no, I didn't see a ball pat in hesitation there. You know what I mean? And throwing that ball late. Yeah. So that was beautiful. I, I definitely see an improvement right there for sure. It 
Jaden's Jaden's one of those guys, man. I think he's going to be in Green Bay for a long time, and we're going to talk about some of his numbers here in a minute. Now, this next one's definitely got sound, so watch your eardrums, folks, especially you, Tim. Um, this is uh, the pass to Romeo Dobbs. I want you to look at the placement of this ball. This is an even better ball than he threw to Jaden Reed. I'm going to mute it so we can roll it back a couple of times. Look at the placement of this ball here, Tim. Yep. I mean, that is absolutely perfect. And look at Great that. Timing. Watch that top of that route by Dobbs, too. Right there, oh, the yeah. stick. And then he's going to That's stick that left close. foot. Bye. Right there, it's over. And, that, and look, no hesitation, the ball comes out. Yep. The ball's already out as soon as he, you know, makes that move. And this is what we talked about. Because, look, Rome, Rome's running out of room. If mm -hmm. that ball's late, like it has been, like it has been, that's not a tutty. Right. And, you know, can't can't say enough about Romeo, man. The the footwork, the technicality, the route running, the hands, you know, body control. I, 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 yeah, body control. You know, like, I don't know, man. I, I'm I am a Romeo Dobbs fan, and I'm hoping he's he's gonna be around for a while too, because he's a solid piece um on our offense as well but yeah great ball by jordan love put it where our guy can get it and nobody else can and mm -hmm. trust him to make a play there's that trust we talk about trusted him to go up and get that ball beautiful throw right there nose down coming towards the pylon if that's in if it's long or incomplete it's not picked off that's what we're looking for yep definitely and you know again Romero was asking in here, you know, uh, the question is Jordan Love looking a little better. I think he is. I do. And just like Doug Absolutely. said, um, this is kind of the year we signed up for, right? Some of us, some of us were going in saying, all right, man, I can anywhere from six to 10 wins, right? Um, now, we again, I, I've got to say it because I don't want it to be, you know, I don't want it to sound like, uh, you know, that I'm just uh, changing my opinion as we go here. After that week one matchup with the Bears, I went, hold up, we might have something here because you've seen, you kind of seen them at their peak, right? Granted, it was a bad team, but we played a lot of bad teams this year. Yeah, um, but, it's true. Yeah. But yeah, um, I agree. Like, like we talked about last night, I think if you go back this time last month and look at his play and now look at how Jordan's playing, you know, recently, I definitely see improvement for sure. Still things yeah. to work on, but improvement, which is what we're looking for. Right. Let's see, Josh Martin with the super chat. Thank you, buddy. He said, you see the Watson family throwing love under the bus. I have not seen that, but uh, I choose to Twitter a little bit different than everyone else. I don't go to the uh, the hot take arguments. I will say this. Um, you say the Watson family throwing love under the bus. I have a hard time believing that because You're Christian true. Watson and Jordan Love are really, really good friends. I know uh, Mama Watson's talked about Jordan Love uh, to no end and how much she uh, loves uh, the friendship that Jordan Love and Christian Watson have. And uh, on top of that, um, you know, it, it's when you when you guys go, not you, I shouldn't say you guys, when they go at her the way they have you seen some of the stuff that yeah, dude. tweeted at her it makes me sick, dude. It's embarrassing, guys. It's a freaking embarrassment. Oh, this. Yeah. Your son sucks. Your son's fragile. You raised a wuss. It's like, yeah, you, yeah. here's listen. have another one. You degenerate bum yeah. and sit on your couch and pass <laughs> judgment. You can't even okay. lift your ass up off of that couch. Yeah, I, people are ridiculous, dude. Here's my rule of thumb on social media, and I've said it from day one when I started doing the podcast. If I wouldn't say it to their face, I'm not saying it on Twitter. And that's what you've got is a bunch of freaking just internet tough guys. Imagine yeah. coming face to face with Christian Watson and saying, you're made of glass. Yeah. yeah, or or, or while him. while his brother Trey's standing behind him too. Exactly, another dude exactly. you don't want to really screw around with. And, and I hey, man, that, that's a football family, man. Those yeah. guys have been playing football like since childhood, and yeah. you know, Krista and and you know Christian's sister, like they they've been supporting these guys their whole life. I there's no way I believe that they're tearing down a teammate. So I don't know. I don't know what what that's alluding to, but uh, I guess we'll have to scroll the cesspool of Twitter and uh, root around in the garbage section of it and see what we can find. Wait around in there where it gets nice and you. Yeah, get your get your waiters, Clayton. Get some waiters and some some rubber gloves and sift through all that BS. Yeah. All right, uh, Josh Martin with another super chat say Clayton going to have to disagree. A six four wide receiver can't high point a ball in a 50-50 play. He's got to high point it and fight for the ball. You mean like he did last week? When uh when love threw it behind him, 
that one you're talking about? Remember the one he high pointed, twisted in the air, came down and uh, injured his back on the play, knocked the wind out of him. Uh, you mean the the balls that he high pointed last year? Remember the one that that Aaron Rodgers threw in the back of the end zone on the free play? I think it was against the Patriots. Completely mossed the guy, right? Guys, the ball placement matters. I'm not saying that Christian Watson's been a great receiver this year. I'm not. I'm not saying that. But to sit here and pretend like it's okay to throw a ball into coverage, underthrow a ball into coverage. The balls that are being picked, show me the play where a defender doesn't smack Christian Watson's arm or touch the ball where the ball is being picked off, right? Well, and the I'm only not, one the only one we had was uh, second quarter yesterday, I think. Mm-hmm. There was, now, I mean, Jordan threw a ball right. It was one of those, you know, you got to make up your mind. Are you going to catch here? Are you going to bring it in? Yep. Scoot went here with the hands, had it, and, and dropped it. That's a drop, yes. That's yeah. a drop. Okay, running up the sideline with a safety over your head and a DB trailing you the whole time. You know, that's you said it last night, Clayton, man. Do we want to play 50 50 ball football? I don't I mean with any regularity. We I don't never have in Green doing that. Yeah, it's it's always been about timing. It's always been about route concepts, combinations, working the right combination. Half the field, half the field here is a too high beater, right? Or a middle field open beater over here is a middle field close beater. Either that or true progression. And even with true progression, the goal isn't, all right, guys, there's only one defender on that receiver. Let's try that one. The goal is not open, not open, not open, check down. Or not open, open, bang, hammer it in. And if the ball is behind, like Luke Musgrave, everybody makes fun of Luke Musgrave yesterday again, right, going down the scene. And it's like, oh, here's Luke Musgrave stumbling again. Bro, he had to turn backwards to catch the ball. If it had been here, he's on the Jets and in for for a touchdown. Last week, the throw that that Love made. Again, kind of behind him and high. I gave Love a little bit of leniency there because there was a defender right underneath. Again, you're throwing into coverage. It's got to be a perfect ball. And I'm not sitting there pretending like in the NFL, you know, people are just running wide open every every game, okay? And that's, you know, open in the NFL is much different than college football. But I, I think we're spoiled from seeing Aaron Rodgers all those years, you know, yeah. with success and skill and greatness, being able to thread the needle and to mm-hmm. throw, you know, in between coverage or, as we always say, throw a guy open. He's covered. He's covered. I'm going to put the ball here. He's going to go get it. You yeah. know, that takes time. That took years to build that kind of a game and to that kind of chemistry with your receivers. Yeah. You know, we as fans have got to take a, a patience pill. You know, we need to just chill out here a little bit and be patient. This is, you know, <clears throat> we're, we're eight games in to his first year as a starter. Right. You know, are we seeing improvement? Yes. Are we seeing, you know, phenomenal play consistently? No, because this is a work in progress, guys. You know, I think it'll come. I mean, but Aaron Rodgers wasn't throwing laser beams his first year as a starter. We saw we saw those little glimpses, just like we're seeing with Jordan. We're seeing these glimpses where like every couple throws, it's like, wow, look at that throw. Look at that touchdown to Romeo Dobbs. Great ball. Right. Two, three plays later, we're going, oh, my God, what is he doing? You know, that's called, you know, getting it together, man. It's a, a work in progress, man. Nobody you're not just great. That that comes with you know, time and practice and experience. And that's what Jordan's building right now, too. Yeah, and if you'll notice last year, Christian Watson turned it on in the second half of the season, right? It took a four-time MVP half of a year to get the chemistry down with him, right? Yeah. In game. And, you know, one thing that I've definitely been wrong about is thinking, okay, you know, Jordan Love's had three years to practice, right? So he's had basically two two years – there's Anna. She's getting upset. She's like, can we move on to a different topic already? <laughs> um, it, it used the, uh, it, you know, it took him over, over half the year last year to, to get that chemistry down with it. And with Jordan Love, he's been practicing for three years. I'm going, okay, he, he should have the timing down this and that in game is different. Right. And that's one thing. It seems like every year I have to write down two or three things that I learned this year that I thought I knew. And uh, that's one thing I'm learning this year is like, look, it don't matter how long you practice, you've got to get that in game time right to see if if you can actually get that timing down with people but again i think people don't like my stance on this type of topic because my stance is very boring you know you've got plenty of people on twitter that are trying to fuel the fire of division right because it it gets interaction on tweets and all those things right i'm not going to be an interaction whore on the the pod or 
you know, on Twitter or whatever. I'm going to see if I see it, I'm going to say it. And to me, the ball placement has been suspect at times and the receivers haven't played up to their potential. It's it's you know, I could tell you how many times in my note I put bad ball, bad drop, basically meaning it was a bad ball. He didn't help his receiver, but it did touch the receiver's hands and he should have caught it. Right. Yep. And and many people don't like that stance, but, you know, that's just kind of the way I see it for sure. As a matter of fact, I'll just I'll throw this up here. This was a Rob Domofsky tweet, and this is really what's kind of fueling it. One of the one of the comments. And I like Rob. I think he's a great follow. Me personally, I, I don't know. When I want to know what's going on with the Packers, man, I go uh, straight to his first because he's usually got it before anyone else. But Rob Domofsky tweeted out uh, yesterday. He said that was Jordan Love's fourth interception this season when targeting Christian Watson. He has nine total for the season. And then he quote tweeted that and put, make that five INTs while targeting Watson this season. Game over. Now, people read that and immediately, I mean, he got a ton of interaction. It's, yeah, it's because he keeps dropping the ball. He keeps dropping. I'm going, are we, uh, how convenient is it that we're refusing to admit that, hey, he's thrown into coverage, you know? Christian Watson's covered on that play, right? Like, it, that's the part that bothers me is like, tell the whole story. And, and I don't think Rob's doing that. Rob's doing his job. Yep. knows hey look hey us cellular customers i've got good news so don't hit skip forward just yet i'm talking about their special customer event us days what's us days it means exclusive offers just for their customers just to say thanks like up to twelve hundred dollars to upgrade to any new phone no i didn't just misread that that's up to twelve hundred dollars off they must really like you us days at us cellular exclusive offers just for you just to say thanks Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, price line. Ah, mmm. The first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive, sought after, rare, and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at caskers.com. This this is a statistic, no yeah. doubt about it. There's no denial. This is all fact, factual statement here in these tweets. There's no right. nothing that's not true, right? But you know when you put that up there, Tim, you get yep. on interaction. You, oh, my goodness, it's, it's coming, right? Well, boys and girls, a great time as any to remind you that facts don't care about your feelings. Oh no, they don't. They do not. They are twenty twenty three. Yeah. You know, I think you know. I think a lot of this is from the fan perspective, Clayton. What's that? I mean, this is no secret. We love our quarterbacks in Green Bay. That's Mm -hmm. that's what we do, right? We love love our QB ones. Hell, we love our QB twos and our QB threes. We have celebrity backup quarterbacks here in Green Bay. We love our quarterbacks. So I think naturally, a lot of the fan base, especially the the C word side of the, the fan base, the casual side of the fan base is going to just repeatedly side with the quarterback. If there's a drop, it's, it's couldn't possibly be on the quarterback. It's going to be on the receiver. We've, we've done that for years. Um, you know, blaming guys that are trying to chase down a bad ball thrown into coverage and somehow it's, it's not the quarterback's fault. You know, I think that just kind of comes with the territory, but guys, we got to do better as fans. Let's, let's stop with the, uh, hanging on to all this, um, the theatrics and the and the hype and the noise, man. We got to just take a breath and look at what's happening out there on the field. You, you understand it a little bit better. Yeah, and, and I've got to be better at it. I usually don't get pulled into the, the game time tweeting, but I did yesterday yeah. because I've seen people tweeting out, uh, Joe Barry running a light box, Joe Barry running a light box. And then literally two plays later, they load the box, they do a pitch outside and get a, get a fourth down conversion. And I'm like, you wanted the box loaded. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Right. Um, and, and again, you you post your opinion on Twitter, 
and people immediately jump in the mentions to tell you why you're stupid. Somebody comes in my mentions and says you're stupid or gets rude. It's one thing to say, I disagree, man. I think it's this. Okay, gotcha. If we've now interacted two, three, maybe four times, and every time we interact, it's negative. I'm sorry, man. I'm muting you and moving on. Like yeah. we can have a conversation, but you're not, I'm not going to let people ruin my day because they just want to be a troll. That's what a troll, that's a troll. That's a definition of a troll. The only yeah. time I hear from you is when you're being negative, you're trolling. It's that simple. Yeah. What are we wow. here for? Are we, are you here to understand the game better? Or are you here to feel like you're right? And I think a lot of people put a priority on, well, I was right. Right. Okay. Oh, no. Well, what, what, that's great. Be, be right and accomplish nothing. That's, that's fantastic. Right. You know? Yeah. And, you know, the goal is to, like you said, to learn, to get better as a fan, understand exactly what's going on. That's my goal every week. I screw it up every week. I'm the farthest thing from perfect with that. But that's that's the overall goal. The goal isn't to go and tell someone else they're stupid or wrong. And uh, no. that's what I and the quote tweets are what cracked me up. People who are like prominent, I say prominent on Twitter. And it really don't mean anything, but people who have a large following will quote tweet someone who's got 200 followers to dunk on them and tell them why they're stupid. And it's like, why didn't you just comment on their post? Why did you have to quote tweet it? Oh, that's right. You're wanting you're wanting the attention on you. Got it. Makes sense. Right. Well, I used to quote tweet to raise people up, right? Say, hey, man, this is freaking awesome. Check this out. Um, but uh, anyway, it is what it is. That's Twitter, though, man. That is that is the Thunderdome of Twitter. There's no doubt about it. Uh, SDN40 said, got to agree about the 50-50 ball comments. I don't want to hear those words ever again. Any idiot can design an offense around 50-50 ball. Hey, man. Uh, do your job and scheme guys open. Absolutely. And it kind of goes hand in hand with what he says again here in a minute. Um, he says, what happened to the Watson crossers? Thank you. Yeah, bro. What did I say going into that game too? And I, we I'm not, both this, said that. We wanted to see that. This isn't a, we told you so moment. Okay. I'm just saying like, when you looked at it and they play a lot of single high man, it's man slot cross all day long. You've seen it with the Jaden Reed touchdown. I'll tell you another play. Remember late in the game, the screen pass, the halfback screen, the slip screen, they tried to run to, to Aaron Jones. Mm -hmm. If you look at the defense, as soon as he drops back, you've seen the backers kind of bite up. Jade, I think it was Jaden Reed wide open on a crosser. But we were going screen there right now. You and I both said aggress against aggressive defense, we're at the halfback screen. So this isn't – we're not sitting here on, you know, Monday morning saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't say that yesterday. I got you. But when you've seen the crossers coming open, man, and, and Watson on the crossers, you know, you've seen it early in the year, right? It was a blown coverage. The ball came out late, still a huge play. Um, I think it was in week two or three, if I remember correctly. But uh, I'm with you on that, SD, and I, I'm all about scheming guys open as opposed to trying to take the 50-50 balls. And he hit the nail on the head with this one, man. Um, the uh, I'm sorry, not that one, the, uh, the one before when he's talking about, you know, anybody can scheme a 50-50 ball, bro. Anybody can. You can – and any quarterback can throw a 50-50 ball. Like – you drop back, you know where the safety's at. Is it middle open, middle closed? Okay, there's one-on-one, 50-50 -on -one, ball. I did my job. Why didn't he catch it? No, that's bad football, man. That is bad football. It, name the receivers that are great at 50-50 balls. I'll wait. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's 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 Megatron. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Randy Moss, right? Think of the players that you think about. Jordy Nelson was pretty good, but he wasn't on that level, right? You no, know, most of them are probably tight ends. Yeah. That's the other thing. Well, absolutely. Yeah. They're yeah. probably probably big boy tight ends that can Wrong. get up there. Yeah. Wrong. And, and no. you know, that's where you want to go with a 50 50 ball, right? And primarily, you're going to be in the red zone. You're going to be looking to play a little basketball and throw it up to your big, your big targets, you know. Yeah. But like with regularity and a drive part of your offense, you're constantly just, yeah, that's not, it's not a good look. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Let's see here. Um, Romero Hill says, is it time to really uh, – It is it time to really just focus on Dobbs, Reed, and Wicks? Um, here's, here's the deal. Like, they're watching these players all week long in practice, right? They understand, you know, what these players bring to the table way better than any redneck podcast host like yours truly, okay? So you still got a, a tremendous weapon in Watson. The main thing you want to do with Watson – are those deep shot plays, get behind the defense, stretch the defense, all those things, draw some of that safety help. To me, yes, he's six foot four, but when where on the scouting report do you see coming out of college that Christian Watson is a great jump ball receiver? It's not on there. Not there. The big thing for him is he's got the frame to be, right? He was lacking the hands, and he's got just freaking world-class speed, right? 
So in no way, shape, or form would I be drawing up a play to go, and I don't think Matt LaFleur did either, by the way. I don't think Matt LaFleur looked at that and went, hey, good decision, Jordan. I really don't. He, he's not – I don't think he's looking to scheme up 50-50 balls. It's just the decisions that you make, and and every time that the game's on the line, they are thinking play or not play, they being Jordan Love, he's trying to go to Christian Watson, and you just keep continue to throw into coverage. Um, yep. Again, I'm sure there was a better answer on another option. The biggest problem I have, if that's fourth down, I get it, right? Yeah. But on a second down play, when you know it's four down territory and you just got to, you know, you got to just continue moving the ball down the field, that's a tough look there. Definitely I'd like to look. see Coach that's the other thing. Look. Think about this, Tim, and I'll, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but if if you don't get aggressive there and you kick a field goal, right, and then you come back, you kick off, and you get the stop that your defense got again, you're right. They go right down the field and get right back in field goal range, right? That's true. And that's that's the tough part. That and of course missing the extra point, having the extra point block. That's something that nobody's talking about. That's the difference in you just taking a field goal at the end, tying it, and going to overtime. But go ahead, buddy. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say that. I, I agree with that for sure. But I, I was just going to say that. Uh, I wish Coach Lafleur would kind of, you know, realize that. And I'm sure he does. I, I got to be careful how I word this. I would like to see more of stretching the field with the other field stretchers we have. You know, Don Wicks can stretch that field. Jaden Reed can stretch that field. Hell, Romeo Dobbs can stretch the field a little bit. And, you know, we got some decent tight end uh, ability with Luke Musgrave to stretch the field. You know, just once I'd like to see them stretch the field with those guys and send Scoot underneath or on one of these crossers. You know, that, that, that play last year in Philadelphia is burned into my brain forever. You know, Jordan yeah. Love comes into the game and, you know, it's like the second or third throw that, that he had that night was a dart on a crosser to Christian Watson for a touchdown. Yeah. We have not seen any of that this year at all. It and seems I, like, it seems like Jordan Love's comfortable on those crossers too. You know ex- exactly right, doesn't it? It that caters to his game, I think. Yeah. Um. You know, and again, Christian Watson, speed is his number one attribute. So if you've got a chance to get a guy the ball while his wheels are already moving in space with a linebacker trying to trail him across the middle. I mean, that's an ideal matchup. You know, that's yeah. not a 50-50 ball, right? Right. Um, so Romero here in the chat says, you know, is it time to really just focus on Dobbs reading Wicks? That's a great segue, Romero. And I'm going to show you uh, show you guys some tweets here that were really, really impressive. I, or I say impressive. I think they really hit home with me. First of all, Paul Brettel on the rookies. And these are the positives we're talking about. Let me actually, let me do this real quick. I've seen a comment down here. Um, Jim Tyson was at the game, obviously, there in Pittsburgh. He says, I thought the game was an improvement overall. Run defense took a step back, but we were in the game until the last play without the block kick. Uh, who knows? what would have happened. I think all that's very true. Again, the run defense was was bad, guys. I'm, there's no two ways about it. But uh, at the end of the game, man, you get two stops, give your offense a chance to win, right? That's what, that's what the goal is. But Paul Brettel tweeted this out, Tim. He said, of Love's 289 passing yards, meaning yesterday, um, rookies Musgrave, Wicks, and Reed had 199 of them, catching eight of 13 targets with a combined five receptions of 20-plus yards. You guys remember we did the breakdown uh, a couple episodes ago where we noticed that the quarterback rating, it's where uh, Carly Ray was making fun of me for being a stat nerd, (laughs) Uh, where the quarterback rating when targeting these players, right? Um, I think Musgrave had the highest QB rating. Um, You know, Love had the highest QB rating when targeting Musgrave. And then I think it went to uh, Dontavian Wicks, I believe. And then it was Jaden Reed. Here you're seeing that spill over onto the field, right? I thought that was a really, really cool tweet by Paul Brettel. Another one that went out here, Tim, was uh, Jaden Reed. This came from Ryan Wood, and he said, Jaden Reed had uh, best game of his career today, career high, five catches, 84 yards, and a touchdown, but he's had a sneaky good rookie season. Through nine games, 28 catches, 417 yards, four touchdowns. So his 17-game pace is 52 catches for 787 yards and seven touchdowns. All right, let's compare that now. Jaden Reed's 16-game pace of 50 catches for 741 yards and seven touchdowns. Compare that to other notable Packers wide receiver rookie seasons. Greg Jennings, 45 catches for 632 and three tuds. 
James Jones, 47 catches for 676 yards and two tuds. Jordy Nelson, 33 catches for 366 yards and two tuds. Randall Cobb, 25 catches for 375 yards and one touchdown. Devontae Adams, 38 catches for 446 and three touchdowns. Christian Watson, 41 catches for 611 and seven touchdowns. So um, I thought that was really, really cool. The tweet goes on, but those are the ones that are most notable. I mean, you think about this, Tim. He is he is on pace to outperform Greg Jennings, James Jones, Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb, Devontae Adams, and Christian Watson in their rookie years. That's exciting stuff, man. And this is why I like following Ryan Wood. Ryan Wood's one of the best followers on Twitter. Absolutely love him. So make sure you go give him a follow at by Ryan Wood. What do you think about those numbers right there, Tim? Man, that's phenomenal. I mean, those are all Packer Hall of Famers right there for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean – what they can really you say? are. You're right. You know, other than Christian Watson, other than school, like, yeah. I mean, these are for sure Packer Hall of Famers. Um, you know, I I just uh, can't say enough about Jaden Reed, and it's the route running is great. He's slippery um, with yards after the catch too. He's got good hands. Um, speed is there as well. And my favorite thing that I like to talk about with Jaden Reed is his football acumen as a rookie and his IQ and intelligence. Um, as a, as a football player, you know, he had a muffed punt or, uh, yeah, a muffed punt yesterday, um, that he, you know, after, after so many seasons of watching Ty Montgomery and, and, um, you know, Amari Rogers and some of these just disasters in the return game, you know, here's Jaden Reed who finally, finally has a mistake, finally bobbles one. And what does he do? He does what a veteran would do. He immediately falls on the football. You know, most rookie guys in that situation are going to try and pick it up and run with it, and then they're going to get popped, and it's going to get recovered and walked in for a touchdown. That's normally what happens in those situations. And there's Jaden Reed being heads up and just falls on it, and we keep the ball, and and off we go. Um, So to me, it's just as much the mentals as it is the physicals with him because he's just such a freaky good athlete, you know, just an athletic dude with a lot of range. Um, But the fact that his – you know, his football IQ is just astounding for a rookie, you know, just yeah. nothing but Im- impressed with Jaden Reed. Yeah. Um, Omar, Omar in the chat says uh, Musgraves, Musgraves, Reed and Wicks all done fabulous, especially considering how inept the O-line and run game have been. Um, yeah. If you could get that run game going as far as a run blocking. And by the way, guys, go back. If you go back and watch it, I went back and watched several snaps. I'd say probably a full quarter of offense for the Packers. Aaron Jones had nowhere to run the ball. Um, and again, AJ figured it out, right? But you got different different personnel, different sets. All those things will will kind of manipulate the defense a bit. And you can bet your rear in when AJ Dillon was in, they were probably looking at it more from a stance of, okay, we don't have to worry about the home run here, right? Let's play a little soft um, in the run defense and, and maybe capitalize on that. But again, you got to give AJ Dillon credit for a great game too. But Musgraves keeps getting brought up there, Tim. So I want to flash this up real quick. Um, I thought this was cool. And then we'll go to Carly Ray's comment. But um, Luke Musgrave, check this out. Luke Luke Musgrave has 29 catches for 313 yards. Again, this is Ryan Wood. Just I love the way his brain operates. Um, 29 catches, 313 yards. Pace for eighth, 500-yard season for Packers tight ends since uh, 2000 as a rookie. Okay, so check this out. Um, So rookie tight ends who have had 500 yards or more okay as a rookie tight end Finley okay um actually not rookies but just tight ends overall in general 55 catches for 767 yards in 2011 Finley in 09 55 catches for 676 Finley in 12 61 catches for 667 Jimmy Graham in 18 55 catches for 636 Musgrave in 23 54 catches for 591 yards is what he's on pace for Tunyon, 52 catches for 586 yards in 2020. Um, Donald Lee in 07, 48 catches for 575. And then Richard Rodgers in 2015 for 58 catches for 510. So it just shows you that the only tight ends, right, since 2000 who have had 500 yards receiving are all those players. Finley did it three times. Jimmy Graham did it in 18. Tunyon did it in 20. Donald Lee did it in 07. Richard Rodgers did it in 15. Musgraves on pace to do it in his rookie year. Guys, that's exciting stuff. He he should he should be able to break. I believe he's on pace to break or be right around that rookie receptions record as well. But Tim, that's uh that's pretty exciting stuff. If you need that flashed up there, just say so. But uh, Musgrave, 
Another one is turn it on. Again, the quarterback rating when they target him, got to get him more involved, no doubt. Yeah. I was just going to say that should be, um, you know, uh, um, for lack of a better term, a safety net for Jordan Love. You know, you talk about comfortability with targets. Um, you know, we've seen this with lots of teams, man. You lean on that tight end. You got a, you got a good tight end with good hands. He can uh, get you yards after the catch. You know, that's the guy you want to look to, you know, when plays break down or things, you got a big target over the middle or out in the flat, get him the ball. Don't hesitate, get him the ball. Now I do kind of understand the perspective Jordan Love's got because we got a few weapons to throw the ball to. You got, you got Wicks and Reed running around. You got Scoot out there, Dobbs, you know, sometimes it's easy. Like, Oh, I just looked off my tight end and I'm, you know, I'm forcing one down the field. I think uh, Jordan will get more and more comfortable with like, you know, looking for big 88 there and uh, hitting them in stride and, uh, you know, putting it on the right shoulder, the correct (laughs) shoulder um, and throwing on time and in rhythm. This is going to get, it's going to get really interesting for us going forward. But um, yeah, I mean, I think we hit it out of the park with that pick. You know, we got to give it up to Goody there. Luke Musgrave was a, was a great draft draft pick. (laughs) To me, his pass blocking looks like it's improving too. He's really settling in, um, pa- yep. and run blocking a bit as well. You've seen a little bit of that flash last week on Chalk Talk. I put this back up about Jaden Reed because SDN uh, forty in the chat says those those stats are skewed as all of the rookies had better receivers around them taking attempts away, but point taken. I think that's a very very fair point, uh, SDN, and it, it kind of crossed my pat my mind as well. But when you look at that, I believe this is the right one. I'm going to take your stat, your uh, comment down just a second. Yeah. Greg Jennings, who was the number one receiver when he was a rookie? Driver? Yeah, probably Donald Driver. Donald right? Driver. Donald Driver. Would we consider Donald Driver like this Randy Moss-esque? You know what I'm saying? Uh, yes, he was the number one receiver. Worked in the slot the majority of the time, but could play all the positions, right? James Jones, his rookie year, who was the number one receiver? Uh, that would have been – Jordy? No. Probably but it would have been Greg Jennings. I Jennings at yeah, I was just gonna say that was right, that time, right? Yep. So Greg Jennings, when Greg Jennings was a rookie and got these great numbers, right? The number one receiver was probably Donald Driver, right? So when James Jones was a rookie, the number one receiver was probably Greg Jennings, right? Uh Jordy Nelson, when he was a rookie, the number one receiver probably would have still been Greg Jennings, right? So it's you can see how the baton was kind of passed, right? Each time. Uh, Devontae Adams, when he was a rookie, who was the number one receiver? I'm trying to think. It was Jordy. Definitely Jordy, right? Probably Jordy, yeah. yeah. And then Christian Watson, when he was a rookie last year, who was the number one receiver? That's probably the most impressive one, right? Because yeah. the number one receiver last year, guys. Dobbs. Adam Lazard. Yeah, Lazard or Dobbs. <laughs> so, I know everybody's trying to throw Christian Watson off the bus here, but what he did last year was pretty impressive. Right. This year he's struggling, but the quarterback's struggling with some of the accuracy, the placement on those balls as well. Um, so just something to take into consideration. But again, I think that's a great comment there, uh, SDN. You gotta you gotta take all all things into consideration, right? When you're talking about uh these type of uh very, very specific statistics. Carly Ray in the chat said, Did anyone see who did the first punt return for us? Gave me flashbacks to Amari Rogers, looked like he was catching a watermelon. That was uh Jaden Reed. And if you'll notice too, I kind of I kind of got ticked off because it looked like the halo rule. I'm pretty sure the halo rule still exists, where you're not allowed to get within what is it like three yards, two yards of the guy catching it. And the pits and this is this is how Mike Tomlin coaches. I guarantee he coaches guys to do it. You'll notice the Pittsburgh guy gets as close to him as he can and runs right by his shoulder and kind of interferes with you know yep. at those guys. It takes a different human being because listen, guys, they can hit you. It's a penalty. But I think we would all agree they if they want to lay you out, they can. It takes a different human being to stare straight up into the air <laughs> while you <laughs> other guys bearing down. Knowing, your- knowing that a semi truck is heading directly for you. And they can do whatever they can hit you. It's a penalty. But they can still hit you. That that takes a different human being. So um it, it did look like Amari Rogers, Carly Ray. Um, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It kind of I think it hit him in the face mask and went through his arms. Luckily he recovered it. Those are few and far between with Jaden. You go back and watch him in college and then what he's done as a punt returner here in the NFL. He's very, very good at securing that punt. But uh, I think it was a good observation by your point. It's nerve wracking. But again, if you if you go back and watch it and I could be wrong. But in the moment, I remember thinking, is there not a halo rule anymore? It kind of felt like that guy almost rubbed shoulders with him. He was so close. But 
Maybe uh, it's like uh, traveling in the NBA, you know, they just don't call it. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, it's technically a rule, but we don't really, we don't really call it anymore. Yeah. Now check this out. Jim Tyson in the chat said, on a personal note, I had a great time meeting Packer fans at the game yesterday and the Steelers fans were pretty well behaved. That's what I've always heard about Steelers fans. Um, then he said, uh, I heard a few quote, hey, cheeseheads, sit down, and a couple cheese and crackers comments, but nothing offensive. <laughs> uh, I definitely had too many, quote, daddy sodas, though. So, yeah, you, you probably don't remember the worst of them there, Jim, if you had a couple daddy sodas. That's a good thing, man. You got to numb that out for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, this is tough right here, Omer. I think you shared this one on Twitter, and I've seen it. He said, you see the tape of Deguar on the extra point uh, block. He patted the guy on the back as he ran <laughs> by to uh, – to get an easy block, his blocking is beyond atrocious. Uh, went to the Royce Newman School of Air Blocking. Um, I did see that clip, Tim. It's bad, man. It's uh, yeah. uh, the it, it's not. Listen, you miss on picks, right? GMs miss on picks all the time. But Just the good admit GM, it. Yeah, the good GMs acknowledge it. The guy does nothing well. He doesn't, and he's another guy that's just a great guy. Like seems like he's just man. You want it to work out, but. How much more do you got to see? And I think earlier in the chat, I think it was Omer said, uh, you know, trade Savage, trade Deguara. The problem with that with Savage is, um, you know, or I think he said cut him is what it was. If you cut Savage, you're on the hook for the money regardless, right? So the goal would have been to trade him, okay? And I think that was the actual comment was uh, was obviously cut, not trade. We're beyond the trade deadline now. But if you would have acknowledged that with Savage and just traded him for a seventh-round pick, that travels. You could do a conditional seventh round pick and say, "Hey, look, we you may not give us anything, but if if anything, they're taking that that money travels with them. They're taking that seven million off the cap, whatever it's prorated for how many games you played. I'm sure that comes into effect. Roll it in the next year. But Goody's not willing to admit when he makes a mistake. That's that's the true story of this season that that many of the Goody fans don't want to acknowledge, and it, it's tough for me to just sit back and and again, I don't comment on other people's tweets, but man, it's tough when they're like. He does no wrong. Like you, you're you're refusing to admit you missed on Deguara. You're refusing to admit you missed on Myers. Although some people are still dying on that hill, you refuse to admit that you uh, you missed on Savage, and you just keep. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And twelve said it last year. I don't know if you guys remember, but he said they they said, well, how do you fix it? He said, I think you start cutting people's playing time. That's what he's talking about. If they're not getting the job done. Move on to the next guy. Right. Which is and, like, why do we have to say this at the NFL level? This is like Pop Warner school of coaching. Right. Like, <laughs> and, and why do we crucify Aaron Rodgers when he said it and say he's a bad teammate? No. he's and, and Guys, remember when he came back and he did that scorched earth press conference, right? Uh, when he first the, when they first announced he's going to be coming back with the Packers, I think it was 2021, whenever it was. You know, he, he, he was like, his whole approach was, I don't want to be a lame duck quarterback. This is what he meant. He could he could see the team was kind of being set up to go. All right, look, we're about to do a reset here, right? And he did he he didn't want his last two years to be like what's seemingly looking like what Aaron Jones's last two years are going to be, which is basically I'm stuck on a team that's not really competing for a Super Bowl because the GM wants to turn the roster over. Um, and I'm I'm not necessarily saying hey look I disagree with Goody doing that. We'll see. The only time will tell, right? We may look up next year and go holy cow, look at this, right? Yeah. Um, but, but what uh, we are saying is if you if you miss, admit it and let's correct the absolutely. issue. Don't no, don't keep sit, sitting on a sinking ship uh when it comes to these players, you know? Yeah. And and yeah, hey, Omer hit it on the head right here. Run that tape back. That that extra point was blocked because of Josiah Deguara. I'm There's sorry. no doubt about it. No doubt yeah. about it. Yeah. And those are the things that that you that don't really get told in the box score that, you know what I mean? Like when you, you watch the highlights on good morning football, you may see the block, but you don't know who it was. You don't. And it's just, well, this coaching staff's horrible, right? I think there's enough blame to go around. Don't get me wrong, but that's uh to me, you, you, I have a hard time believing that Matt LaFleur is going to Goody and going, man, it's the Guara dude. He's about to get it. They're probably sitting in that meeting going this, 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 and is wrong. And just like many staffs do, Goody's probably looking at him like, no, nah, I think he's a good football player. You need to make it work. You're the head coach. You know what I mean? Um, but and I don't this logic of like, oh, well, you know, he's he's not as big a role in our offense. So let's stick him on special teams. It, right. And then he ends up costing us on special teams. It's like, dude, where's the next stop? You know, yeah. the next stop is practice squad and then goodbye. Like you, you have to be decisive. Yeah. 
Carly Ray said, let's uh, let's see the halo rule become a point of emphasis for next week. I, I'm so sick of hearing point of emphasis Carly, after last week. By the way, that, that sneak that Pittsburgh ran, go look at the tape. I paused it and rewound it live on the broadcast, and it's kind of hard to see sometimes. It sure looked like those guards' helmets were in line with the ball. So funny how it only gets emphasized in a game where uh, two teams that – probably not going to make the playoffs, right? It's like, okay, this is a good good one to put the example in. And, and since we're talking about officiating, let's just go to it here, Tim. A lot of people brought it up here. Um, uh, let's see. I think it was – bang, right here. Bleeding Green and Gold said, the backward lateral can't, can't be understated. They even looked at it a second time and still got it wrong. That is the difference in this game. Bad calls like that can't happen. Completely agree. I'm not one to to say that a call costs someone a game. I think there's a lot of plays you can make it up, and I think there's a lot of truth in that, but absolutely horrendous. The part that's so hard to stomach is this happens all the time. You guys remember they put the pass interference review rule in, right, where you can now review pass interference, and then all year long, everyone watching the game at home, fans from non-biased fans from different fan bases looking at it and going, how in the world did they not overturn that? Or You know what I mean? This this play right here, the question is, you've got to say, okay, you don't have to say it went backwards. All you have to say is, did it go forward? And the answer is no. The answer is it actually went backwards. But even a lateral, if they can't prove that it went forward, then by rule is a, is, is a lateral, okay? So we've got an image we're going to pull up on that. Um, let's see right here. Omer agreed. He said, yes, lateral was another atrocious call by the referees. So many games being affected by poor officiating all around the league this season. And that's the thing, too, Omer. Omer I think you say it great there. Um, very well stated. You know, we're not sitting here saying the Packers are the only team that's getting screwed. Their fan bases all across the league are agreeing. Here's the image I want to show you all. Kurt Benkert sent this out. Look at where his hand is, where he threw the ball. And then the other Look line. Where the ball's the- going. Yeah, the, the the yellow solid line is where the ball ends up, okay? I wish he had another shot there showing where the ball ended up, but that's essentially what he's showing there. That is a and the, fact. And the, and the blatantly obvious fact that, that the receiver had to turn around and catch the ball behind him on his back hip. It's wild, man, absolutely wild. I saw got- that live and called backwards pass. My wife had to give me – had to tell me to calm down. I was fuming when this play happened. Yeah. And then imagine my surprise when they when we challenge and they look at it again and they still screw us. That's the part that's so hard to handle. It's that's like, the part that makes you wonder about what's really going on. And, and, I, and I'll, that's as far as I'm going to go. I'm not going to we're not going to do a conspiracy corner at, you know, this you make it up. I'm not one to I, I don't want to even entertain the thought that games are decided by the refs on purpose. I don't. But when you see something like this, man, God, it's so tough. It's and so again, tough. Our <laughs> guys finished that play so well. I'm so proud of Carrington Valentine, Rashawn Gary flying in, ignoring the stupid whistle from the ref because they're playing football and they saw a backwards pass. They saw a live ball on the ground right. and they played through it. And we don't get, we don't get the, the reward for that. And that's, I guess that's why it's so frustrating. We yeah. don't know if, um, we would have came away with points or not it, had they get, given us the ball and maybe not the the continuation in the touchdown because they blew it dead. Maybe we get first and goal in that situation. There's no guarantee we put a touchdown on the board, but I'm pretty sure we would have. In, in seven point swing is what. It yeah, is. it's a pretty big part of the game. Now, yeah, you can't point to this playing goal. That's why we lost. No, but my goodness gracious, yeah. what is the point of review in 22 cameras covering this game? And then we got to hear Gene Serator on the broadcast telling us it ain't a good angle. Are you kidding me? Charles Davis, bro. Charles Davis said, Are you I got to disagree. Like you said, Clayton, the angle helps us see that it's backwards. <laughs> Sterator actually said, now Charles, he prefaced it. Charles, I know you're going to disagree with this, but dude, come on. Let, I know so- you're going to disagree with this because I'm only saying this because I want to continue to get my paycheck and not ruffle any feathers. Yeah. You know, he's going to toe the line, man. A lot of these guys will. And, I, hey, I get it, man. People got families. You got miles to feed. You got a career. You know, <laughs> you don't want to throw your throw your job away, you know, on principle. But, hey, I also respect the people that are willing to, to step up. And if you see it, you got to say it. Right, Clayton? Right. I and mean, this is just so blatantly you, obvious. You see the image here, okay? I want you guys to keep this visualization in mind here. What Kurt Ben Kurt tweeted out here, showing the dotted line 
was obviously the plane in which the ball was thrown from, and then the solid line being where they got caught it. Now let's go to the video here. Okay, here we go. I'm going to play this real quick if I can. <laughs> it's so bad, dude. It's so bad. Let, You're going to look me in my eye and tell me that ball went forward. Stop yeah, exactly. it. And uh, Tim, you, you hit the nail on the head. You don't even got to say it went backwards, although we know it did. But you, you, you've if this ball doesn't go forward, right? If it does, it look, here's the thing. They're saying, oh, the angle doesn't help. Look at where the quarterback is standing. You see the line coming across the field. That's what I was saying by the angle should help you, if anything. Look at where the ball is caught. That's insanity. And again, if it hadn't been challenged, if it, if we're sitting here talking about, uh, you know what? Hey, look, in the in the moment, it's hard to catch these things in real time, all that stuff. I got you. They looked at it from multiple angles. Angles right. probably didn't even see. And they still said, you know what, we're going to do. I would just love to hear, and it's where I think the, I think it was the XFL got it right, Tim. You should have to have the audio on the broadcast, too, of the officials talking. Yeah. Because if something is said, if something is said, we're like, no, guys, look, we really need this to, you know, stay here. That you know what I mean? It's going to be real fishy. Rather than okay, look, yeah, I would love to hear if the conversation was, yeah, no, it it was definitely a forward pass. I I'd, guarantee you that wasn't said. I'd love to hear the conversation being pumped into the ref's earpiece. It's what I'm that, talking about. Yeah, that, the conversation. Oh yeah, okay. I thought you were talking about the refs' conversations with uh, each other. There's I'd like to hear there. what what New York is saying to yeah. these officials on the field. That and again, you know, not not to try to prove that the games are fixed, Tim. So we have the clarity and go, okay, let's let's put it to bed. But the only reason you wouldn't share that audio is because maybe something said they wouldn't put it to bed. You know what I mean? Yep. Like it's tough, dude. It's tough. I mean, you see it live, you're screaming, live ball, live ball, it's a live ball. Yeah. Again, look at this. Think think of the running back turning around and look at where the ball is placed. Right. That's why. Like it if <laughs> I'm done with it. <laughs> I can't, like you said, it doesn't have to, you don't even have to call it backwards. The ball didn't go forward. That's exactly. exactly right. That's the that's the whole point of this. Was not a forward pass. You want to talk semantics about what it what you think it was. It certainly wasn't forward. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough, man. Um, we got to get out of here. We just hit the hour mark. Um, let's yeah, see. we're already we're blaming refs. We don't want to do that. Yeah, we don't want to do that. That's not why we lost, guys. Yeah, it, exactly. It's we gave not. up two hundred and five yards on the ground. That that might have been a bigger reason why we lost. I'll tell you why we lost him. We lost the turnover differential battle to the best of my knowledge, right? Um, you threw an interception in the end zone, into coverage. That needs to be said. Throw an interception in the end zone in the fourth quarter. You had an extra point blocked. You gave up over 200 yards on the ground rushing. The officials – temporarily lost their vision <laughs> right. there's there's name one name something but what's crazy is and this is what gives me so much hope all of that we just said and you only lost by four points right is that what it was for is that, is that right am i thinking right 23 yeah. to yeah four points right you know so, what though clayton we've been saying that so many times this year right yeah and that's the thing like so so what is it why can't we get over that hurdle what is it, Tim? Think about it. Because I, as I'm saying, I'm, I'm tired of saying this. What's the first thing that comes to mind for you? How do you fix it? How do you win a close game in the NFL? Because we, we can't figure out how to do it. I'm telling you, it's too well. Close. Well, I have one thought in my mind. You don't run gadget plays on third and 11. That's something we you didn't have to list, right? <laughs> we, we, could not, we could stop doing that. We could stop running gadget plays on third and 11. Or, yeah. um, you know, I – I got one for you. Go go ahead. I want to hear it. <laughs> Veteran experience. Veteran experience. Yeah. If you if you were to say to me, Clayton, game on the line. I, I seriously, this is a serious question. Game on the line, right? You need a touchdown to win this game. I've got two rosters built for you. Would you rather have the youngest roster in the league or the oldest roster in the league? Which one are you taking? I want the one that's a hybrid. I want I want the one with some, some young talent and some old dogs in there. Yeah. You know, that's what I want. And I don't want to go either too far to either direction, honestly, because a team full of old dogs isn't isn't always the best thing either. So your number one choice would be 
a good a good male to hybrid, right? What would be yeah, your number but two? Definitely, I see veteran leadership for sure. Okay. Yeah. So when you look at it from that perspective, that's that's why I have a hard time with Lafleur falling on the sword with all of the scrutiny on Jordan Love, the people that don't like Jordan Love, all the scrutiny on Christian Watson, right? You don't have who who is the where is the veteran leadership in that wide receiver room? And this is the thing. This isn't it's Romeo Dobbs. That's who it is. Yeah. This Which isn't is crazy. The, this isn't the redneck Packer fan Clayton trying to convince people of this. This is what Mark Towser says. Mark Towser talks about how it was so important that he had Chad Clifton in that room with him, right? Um, and then guess what Brian Bulaga says? Brian Bulaga says it was so important for him to have, I believe he said Mark Towser. I think they might have played together briefly. Um, it was so important that he had he he named a veteran in there. He's like, you don't have veterans in these position rooms. You're really, really limiting the growth potential. And like Wildy pointed out, which I know a lot of people aren't fans of Wildy, but Wildy's been right about a lot of stuff this year, guys. We got to call it as we see it. One of the things he said is, you're telling me that it wouldn't help these tight ends having Mercedes Lewis as the fourth as the fourth tight end instead of DeGuara? Let me ask you this. Who would you rather have preventing that block kick on the edge? Good Josiah job. DeGuara or Mercedes freaking Lewis? Yep. And that's when immediately the, the talk goes to – well, Mercedes Lewis isn't a isn't a playmaker, he isn't a game changer, this and that. Those are the little things you got in a Mercedes Lewis. I'm sorry. On some of those double sifts they tried to run, who would you have rather had? A rookie, Tucker Craft, or a Mercedes Lewis? And again, Mercedes Lewis pennies on the dollar. He would have wanted to come back. What's crazy is Matt LaFleur said openly in his press conference, we'd love to have a Mercedes Lewis back. And then they asked Goody, and what did Goody say? Well, that's going to take snaps away from the young guys. Okay. It's going to take snaps away from Deguara, who has proven but, nothing. But it's like you're a GM. Way. You're a GM, man. Like, why? Are, let the coach figure out who's getting the snaps. Right. Right. I mean, let's be honest. I, 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 I could deal with that if that came out of Lafleur's mouth. Hey, well, exactly. you know, we we got some young guys. We want to get reps. I'm not hearing that from my coach. I'm hearing a coach saying, "Hey, we'd love Big Dog back for another year. Could yeah. provide some veteran leadership and stability in that tight end room." Yeah. And then we have a GM going, "Well, you know, I, I." Got all these draft picks, man. We got to get them the ball. And it's yeah. like, are you a GM or are you a coach? Right. Exactly. It's a good point. It's it's why it's got to kind of meld together. And again, I think we would all agree now what's held it together the last three years or since LaFleur came in and since Goody took over is I mean, there's one big difference in this roster, right? There's well, there's a few big differences, but the the major one is you let Aaron go, right? You trade Aaron, and then on top of that, you let Mercedes Lewis go, Randall Cobb, Alan Lazard, all those guys, right? And, again, not that Randall Cobb's going to go out there and put the numbers up that these young guys are putting up, but the veteran leadership in that room, it, it makes a difference. It does, I think. And, and Especially when you – like you had hit it on the head, Clayton, when when these guys aren't looking at the organization going, give me give me $25 million. They're, they're They're willing to take the that pay cut, that end-of-career stage veteran – I'm basically a player coach. I'm like an extension of the coaching staff. Yeah. You know, Mercedes wasn't playing hardball with money. No. He, he probably oh, would have signed right. whatever we put in front of him, you know, to play. So, yeah. I'll tell you someone else who probably doesn't miss that block either. And he wasn't a great blocker. It's probably Bob Tunyon. Yeah. Like, I'm just being real. That's, that's not to say that Bob Tunyon is a great player. I'm not saying that. It's just going to show you how much DeGuara has underperformed in key situations. Uh, Red Bow in the chat said, I still miss Mercedes. Um, let's see right here. Uh, Mercedes was a, quote, run through a wall for him type of dude. Uh, young bloods need that mentality instilled into them. Completely agree. Think about where you work. And and the people that have these opinions that, that this stuff doesn't matter, I guarantee you, you look at their job. They work in a cubicle. They work in isolation. They don't depend on other people to make things happen. Bro, I used to do concrete and steel work. When you're on that job site, and you're out there and you're dangling from rebar from a from a grade beam 45 feet in the air, and you know this guy's watching everything that's going on around you. When you're running a concrete pump truck holding literally a rubber hose 45 feet in the air, and you're by the way, you're not tied off, just being honest. <laughs> and I know when OSHA shows up, boy, that thing gets latched quick because you know, safety first. But when OSHA ain't around, you it's get the great get the concrete and the beam, get it finished, let's go home and cut down on payroll. That's how that works. But when you're up there, I'll never forget, I had a guy, Chris, working with me. I'm working that pump, 45 feet in the air, over at a place called Milligan College here in town. And I'm walking this grade beam, right? 
And he told me beforehand, he said, listen, if that hose gives it all, I mean, if it if it shifts six inches, he said, you let go. You let go, you get center of balance, and you hold on to this beam, right? Sure enough, I'm walking across. I'm full of piss and vinegar. I'm like 24 <laughs> years old. I, I Ain't nothing hurt me. I'm walking this beam holding this hose, and it gives, right? And it goes, and what did I do? I tried to grab it. Try thinking I was going to hold it. It's just natural. Right. I'm telling you, before I could even get my balance completely, I get the loudest bang, 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 bang on my hard hat. And I was like, what is hitting me in the head? And I finally looked back, and it was Chris. He pulled his clients out and just beat the hell out of me over the helmet. And he was like, I, I mean, he you. was so mad. And he got the point across. When you're having to work in a in a – somewhat hostile environment, I guess you could say, an unsafe situation or a situation like what pro football is, where it's, look, man, it, it, I mean, split-second decisions determine whether you win or lose, whether you get paid or get cut, all those things. You want people around you that's got your back, right, and they know what the heck they're doing. Yep. When you go out there with a roster this young, that's why I'm saying let's cut down on the LaFleur hate just a bit because, man, he was put in a bad situation with this roster being so young. Now, there's some potential and upside. And, again, this isn't just all goody hate. Look at the Reed pick. Great pick. Musgrave, yeah, great right. pick, right? Dontavian Wick seems to be a great pick. Jordan Love's showing flashes. He could be the guy. I'm LBN. still on that. Yeah. yeah. But you're going to lose close games when you decide to go with this this uh, this young of a roster. And that's where Jason Wilde got it right. And he said earlier in the year, like, he was the one who beat it home. I mean – he hammered it home about Mercedes Lewis. So you're saying that you don't want that veteran leadership because you're afraid it's going to take away snaps. How many snaps would it possibly take away if Musgrave is your starting tight end? And who cares if it's taking away snaps? If the I snaps guarantee you Musgrave are... don't care. Yeah. It, well, and the snaps we're getting aren't that great. Right. Oh, no, we're taking away Josiah DeGuara snaps? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that's the thing. Like, that's the snap that you took away from. But, again, if you're a GM – who's not willing to acknowledge I probably missed on that pick. That's how that happens, right? That's exactly how it happens. The same way that you're willing to pay $7 million to Darnell Savage when, you know, the Bill Parcells school of thought, and this, I know it sounds cold hearted, but Bill Parcells was one of those guys. He was non, non, uh, no nonsense type of coach. I love Parcells. He said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. That's what he always said about player personnel. When a player shows you who they are, believe them. Don't try to make them into something that that you want them to be, right? So, uh, That's right. Look at this. As we sign off here, uh, Beard Don hops in and says, "Morning, guys. <laughs> Morning, Beard. Appreciate you swinging through." <laughs> um, obviously, you guys can go back and watch it um, uh, later if you want. You know, it's on YouTube and and kind of on demand if you will. So, I'm enjoying doing the the morning show. The crowd. It's so cool to see you get a little bit different crowd in the morning than the evening. And uh, the evening gets a little off the rails, guys. There's no doubt about it. And I think that I think it should be like that. As a matter of fact, we got a clip from last night. I want you to th- key. And we're going to sign off after this. I'll get your final thoughts, Tim. I want you to key on three dynamics to this clip from last night. Okay, in the post game show. That's why you guys need to make it to the post game show. We have a blast. So a listener asks uh, something along the lines of, "What does Christian Watson do well?" I want you to look at me. Try to come up with something. So watch me trying to come up with something. I want you to quickly glance at Tim, how he looks like he's ready to kill somebody. Right. And then watch Emilio try to button it together. Like the little brother that he is. Watch this. You ready? Again, tall girl. Thank you for the super chat. Josh Martin with the super chat says outside of running fast. What does Watson do? Well, he can't high point the ball. Doesn't fight for the ball, drops the ball, gets hurt a lot. Um, He can block. (laughs) <laughs> He's been blocking well this year. Emilio said he can block. <laughs> you call me anything you want, but you don't call me All right. I, I can't imagine that a receiver wants to wants to be called a good blocker and not, not good at anything else. No, man. But I'm telling you, man, Tim, that absolutely broke me up, bro. I'm crying again right now. Just you, classic. Knowing what was going through my head, I wanted to go. Come on, guys, stop hating on Christian. And I'm going, 
damn, he's got a point. I can't say anything here. <laughs> and you up in the top just <laughs> looking like Jeffrey Dahmer or something, bro. Just... <laughs> hey, careful, man. I'm from Milwaukee. Careful with that Dahmer oh, stuff. Oh, man. oh, oh, whoa, whoa. There it is. That's like that's like you can't you can't that's the name. We don't say that name. <laughs> no, I'm just saying no, but that's funny. You know what's crazy though? I was so angry looking because I don't I don't I'm like you, man. I don't get all the hate. I don't get all the Christian Watson hate. Right. You know, I don't I don't make that was what was going through my mind is like yeah. why are we turning on this guy? You know what Christian Watson does well? You know, we've had a little time to think about that answer. He deals with adversity well. You know, yeah. and um a guy who's been dealing with these struggles that he has, uh, especially this year, and the vitriol and hate that he's getting from fans that supposedly love him and this team. We're we're all supposedly Packer fans. Um I think this guy stays positive. It has a great attitude. And um, you Works don't see hard. that a, a lot of time with young players. Sometimes you know, young players, that stuff can get in their head and, and ruin it for them. So, you know, ease off a little bit, guys, on this. I know it's frustrating. Nobody likes losing games. And like you said, Clayton, winning fixes everything. Keep winning games. Show, show us as fans that you can win two games in a row. You haven't won two football games in a row. And that's really what, you know, we were looking for here. And that's why it was so you know, gut wrenching to, to walk away with a loss yesterday. But Hey, at the end of the day, man, these, these guys are human beings, man. Yeah. You know, it's like, right. talk about their play, but that's it. Draw the line there. So I would say that that's my answer. I think Christian deals with the hate pretty well. Yeah. And you know, the, the thing, I think that the reason I'm a little more critical on Goody than everyone else is because these players have to face that on Twitter. They have to go up and talk in the locker room after after having a bad game or, or have, after hearing all this stuff, hearing people go after his his family on Twitter and all those stupid, toxic things. Matt LaFleur has to go out there with the youngest team in the NFL and try to put together a winning season somehow, some way, right? And then he has to go up immediately after losing a tough game every single week and talk to the media. And Goody has to speak one time, one time a year. That's just wild to me. That's why I'm a little more like come that and and when I when I say why why hasn't Goody said anything people go oh don't go there he doesn't have to talk to he should if his coach you want to talk about good leadership a, a good leader will deflect praise right and absorb criticism when the team's struggling if Matt's got to go up there by God I'm going up there if my players have to face this scrutiny I'm gonna face this scrutiny. The fact that it's just laid back and, you know, okay, yeah. Well, I got my one presser in this year. I understand he's scouting. He was at the, you know, the the uh, the game this weekend. I know Jake's been talking about all the games he's traveling around to. I got you. Do a conference call or something. Just do a quick media session on Zoom. That way you're absorbing a little bit of it too. It's, it's called culture. It's called, you know, these players, some of them might be bitter that we know they were bitter. Rasul Douglas was cut or was traded, right? All these things. And now they're sitting back going this, you know, they, they, they traded my buddy, right? Who was a team leader here in the locker room, which by the way, it's just still amazing to me that everybody is now all of a sudden when he's not on the Packers roster, Rasul Douglas is a bad football player. That blows my freaking mind. He was, when he was traded the week before he was traded, he was the second highest graded player on the Packers roster, Right. And, and nobody had anything negative to say. The second he gets traded, the Goody fans or the Goody apologists immediately come in. And go, well, you know, he's actually had two, three bad games. He's played. It's like, bro, really? Is that, are we doing that now? But it's all about culture. And I'm not saying Goody has to do that. But if I was Goody, I would be getting in front of the media somehow, some way and starting to absorb a little bit of this, take some pressure off of Matt, take some pressure off these players and say, hey, look, you know, I put this team together. We wanted to go young. I believe in them and, and stand up there and say something like that rather than just, well, you know, I just think we ain't executing. I think we're leaving plays out there and this and that. Like basically saying there's nothing wrong with this roster and also be willing to admit, hey, I made a mistake, right? You know, you could say that about a DeGuar. If, if, if he came out and did a presser, and let's say DeGuar was cut, and I'm not calling for anybody to be cut. Let's just use that as an example since we've seen it's bad play, blocked extra point, all those things. If he comes out this week and, and let's say he cut DeGuar, do a presser and say, you know what, man, it was it was a pick. It was a mistake I made. And uh, just want to thank Matt and the and the players for, for trying to patch it together. No no offense to DeGuar. 
Hopefully he gets picked up somewhere else and has a great career. But that was that was my bad, admitting a mistake. You know how far that would go for the culture of the locker room? And some people might think, oh, they're grown men. They need to get over it. Okay, again, those are the ones that work in the cubicle and don't depend on other people to help them do their job good. That's just you know, and I, I agree. And there, you can say that without dragging uh, Josiah DeGuara at all. You can simply, you know, own up to the fact and say, "Hey, you know, well, uh, Josiah is a great player. He's just not a good fit." You know, it's and we, like you said, wish him success somewhere else. Um, but we're not getting that. We're not getting that accountability. You know, I mean, you look at any organization. I don't care if it's you know the store down the street or whatever. If there's issues, the first place you want to look is general management. Absolutely. I mean, to be honest, it's general management. And then, and beyond that, then yeah, ownership. Well, we know how ownership works here in, uh, in title town. So, you know, you got to go with GM, right? Yep. Definitely. Uh, one last comment. We're going to get out of here. We're way over on time, but this has been a good conversation. Man. Chat's been absolutely awesome. Um, a fam, I think I'm saying that right. A fam or a fam says at Clayton, who I know is a Kentucky Homer, ha ha winky emoji. Um, Valentine sure looked lost and frail. I think a second year jump will be exciting to see. He had a tough game yesterday and him grabbing on that jersey. Now, again, keep in mind the people who the people who were defending Goody last week for trading Russell Douglas took a little victory lap last week, right? You know, the locker room seemed fine to me, right? I thought it was supposed to destroy the locker room. You when you play well, right, and things are going somewhat positive, you know, i.e valentine having a good game last week yeah culture isn't an issue pat mcafee talks about it all the time those same people hate pat, pat mcafee show but they don't want to hear former players telling the truth um but with that being said it you're going to see that culture issue rise up when things are going really really bad they're going bad right now but we're not getting blown out right that would be really bad right now this team's trying to compete right and that's what kind of keeps people a little more on rather than cleaning house, like I know several people in the chat have said. And that's the other thing too, Tim. Is there any scenario? I'm going to ask you this question as we wrap up. And, and again, uh, I completely agree, uh, FM. Uh, I think that Valentine had a bad game uh, yesterday. And I was so excited for him. And I think he's still going to be a great player. Don't get me wrong. He's shown those flashes. We've seen his ceiling. Now we need to get a good gauge of his floor. And let's see how they can manage him and get the, get the most out of him. Um, but uh, – what was I asking you just now, Tim? There was a specific question there. Do you remember? Uh, you, you were going to ask me something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Lord, it's gone. It's already gone. Um, it was good, too. I'm telling you, it was life-changing, bro. I think – Can't remember it. <laughs> just to piggyback off that, though, you're right. Valentine didn't have a great great game yesterday. But, you know, that's how you get better. You know, yeah. you're going to have bad games. You're going to make mistakes. And that's how you learn and move forward, you know. Yeah, just... definitely. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Um, again, the secondary didn't get better. It got weaker when you traded Russell Douglas. You gave up a fifth. You got a third, which is basically – see Lincoln back here. Which is basically a uh, fourth-round value is what you got for Russell Douglas. Um, let me ask you this. Do you think that, that Carrington Valentine plays better if Russell Douglas is on the field, maybe in the weekly preparation – you know, the things that we're talking about, you see the camera shaking. <laughs> as, as you see, uh, you know, the, the team begin to struggle in the secondary a little bit there on that. And, again, that was man coverage. You guys heard me talk about it all year. I'm tired of talking about it. You play man coverage, you're going to give up explosive plays. And that's what people are seeing this year. Um, but uh, I don't know, man. It's just uh, – that's what I was going to ask you, Tim. I know it now. How many wins – what do you think the record would be that would justify Matt LaFleur losing his job? Or do you think, nope, no chance, no way would I fire him this year? Let's get through this year. If that's the answer, that's totally cool. I, I don't even know if I have an answer, but what's the first thing that comes to mind for you? What would have, what, what, let's say we lose the rest of the season. We don't win another game. Do you think, do you think it's warranted that Matt loses his job, or do you think, no, nah, he deserves another shot? Well, I think, first of all, Matt LaFleur deserves to uh, be here as long as his contract was. I believe he's got like three years left on the deal something yep. like that um to your point you know this is the team that he has been given because clearly there is there's clearly some kind of disconnect between coaching and in the gm office and you know some of these decisions being made um so no I, I i don't think it's about how many wins or losses um 
you know, we've seen 13 and three seasons and we've seen, you know, eight, and nine seasons from, from Lafleur. with this team. We, we always talked about getting a gauge on these players that we have and what, what Matt Lafleur and, and his offensive plans can, can do with these players. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's fair to base it just on the record. And I'll just say this as well. Yeah, I am in the camp that I think we should, we should stick with our coach. And I'm the, the first one to tell you that I don't agree with a lot of the moves all the time. I'll be the first one to call out the stupid gadget play in crunch time during the game. However, I don't think bailing on him at this point or at the end of this year is going to do us any favors. You know, it's real easy to sit here and say, fire them all, clean house. And then you have no plan whatsoever of what the next move is. Your answer to everything is just fire Joe Barry, fire Matt LaFleur, fire Brian Gutenkutz. Okay, well, <laughs> then what? Right. What's the next move there? Then what? You know, it's real. It's spoken like someone who's never had to make a decision uh, right. professionally in their life because everything is be logical in here, Tim. Stop being logical. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Wouldn't want to do that. But no, that's. Uh, That's my thoughts, man. You know, this is not about, you know, when a team struggles, a team struggles and there's failures in multiple aspects of that. You you can't pin this um, on one guy. You know, we can go back to, you know, Big Mike, man. They they ran Big Mike out of here kind of bogus. Mid-season. Yeah. Well, not, not, there was only a couple games left. It wasn't even mid-season. That's a great point. And it's like, dude, you couldn't let this guy coach three more games or whatever. And it's like, I, I don't know, man. I don't think fire them all, burn it down. That, you know, that's a human response, right? That's a innate response when you're frustrated and things aren't going right. But that's not always the answer, man. You know, so yeah. I think we have to look at the pieces we have. We have to put trust in the guys that we've entrusted with these jobs, you know, from Goody on down. So, yeah, man, I'm not I'm not ready to fire Lafleur right now. And uh, you know, I guess talk to me at the end of the year if they drop these next what have we got seven. And games how they lose them, right? That would that would determine too. Like how if if they're in every single game and you're like, okay, Jordan right. continues to improve. Yeah, like That's we've seen, point. we have something to build on, right? Yep. We're not getting boat raced week in and week out. Yeah, you know. Definitely. And if that starts to happen, then then maybe we have these conversations, or maybe we start leaning towards. But I'll tell you what. If you're going to talk about firing Matt LaFleur, I want to hear your top three picks to bring in to coach this football team because, yeah. you know, just pointing fingers without proposing solutions is complaining. And we got enough people complaining right now. Give me a, give me a solution. Same thing with Goody. You want Goody gone? Well, then who who's our GM? Same thing, right? Yeah. What did we say when we, we got rid of Mike Pettin? Everyone wanted Mike Pettin run out of here. And nobody, <laughs> nobody had a suggestion about a defensive coordinator that they wanted. Yep. We go out and make a move, and everyone complains about the move that we made. Yeah. So, hey guys, I don't know. <laughs> People are already- up, man. It's too early for this claim. People are already checking the the team statistics. I guarantee. You. I love this one. Chris Angel says the Lions' offensive coordinator. They're doing good on offense. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a name there, sir? At least Google a name. <laughs> no. Oh, my Lord. It's funny because that's that's how my mind fires, too. It's like, okay, if you do change coaching staffs, who's the better choice? Well, no matter how better the choice is, they're going to be inexperienced. That's, that's a given, right? Unless you're going for someone who's got a track record. I know what's going to happen, though. Uh, and, and we got to get out of here. We're so far over. But this has been a fun conversation, man. We've had so many differing opinions in the comments and everything. Um, the – when Bill Belichick gets gets canned in New England, it's probably coming. That's going to spark up here, I'm telling you. That immediately people are going to go get Bill, go get Bill. And it's like, bro, Bill's 72 years old, man. Bill, Bill ain't going to come here and deal yeah. with these kids, man. <laughs> Think about that, the youngest roster in the league. And you look at how he likes to build his roster. He loves those veterans, man, loves them. Um, but uh, anyway, it's coming. Uh, coming like a freight train. I, I, I'm with you. Like, it, it, it depends on – how they finish, right? And uh, not necessarily the win loss as much as it is if we're still competing. And again, man, you got to look at, and we're going to do it on Chalk Talk. I got to get, I'm way behind on that. Uh, we got to look at the tape and go, okay, what happened and why did it happen? And and the big things that come to mind for me are um, your turnovers, right? Two picks, um, your run defense. Okay. Now you dig deeper and go, okay, why was the run defense bad? Was it bad scheme? Was it bad execution? Was it bad tackling? All those things. Um, 
Yes. There's just a lot to dig into. And you gotta you gotta really understand why. And then you look at that and go, okay, Tim, if if that's what happened and why it happened, okay, does that fall on Matt LaFleur's feet? Does that fall on the inexperience? Does that, you know, there's a lot of different factors to take into play. It, it kind of feels like to me, everybody gets one year here. That's what it feels like, you know. Yeah. So, We'll see, though. I know that's not the fun opinion, but it is what it is. And if and if we're all in agreement that it's a rebuild, right? Like right. I, don't, I don't care what anyone wants to say. Then those take time, right? Yep. You want to tear down your house and rebuild it? You, you, it might take a day to demo it, but you ain't gonna rebuild it in a day. So keep that in mind when you're ready to fire the whole organization, and understand that this is a process, right? We're yep. in the process right now reload rebuild re- retool whatever whatever adjective you want to put in there so this just objectively would be the worst time to change the guard yeah because you're really saying you're, you're in the middle of rebuilding for the future and you're gonna you're gonna fire everybody right now so yeah. i you know agree to disagree though you know it's cool yeah. i know omer doesn't agree with me but that's all right <laughs> me and omer me and omer agree on a lot a lot yeah. more than we disagree on so Absolutely. it's all good man omer's uh He's out out for blood today, my man. Is uh, I love his, <laughs> love his passion. I was a Factor fan, and that's okay. That's what I'm saying. It's okay to disagree. It's totally cool. I was going to read off our current draft picks as, as it sits right now, um, the upcoming. But we'll do that later on. We're going to be back for PTA uh, Packers Total Access Live tonight. Um, so uh, you guys make sure you swing through for that. I'm really really looking forward to uh, to hanging out with you guys, Tim. I don't know if you're available. If you are, love to have you, man. As always. Um, and um, what was the other thing I was going to hit on? We're going to hit on that. We'll have, uh, I'm sure we'll have a little bit more, maybe a few, a few more injury updates, things like that from the roster. Like I said, we'll talk about the draft picks. Also, Gunsmoke Games. If you're watching this, shoot me an email, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. Gunsmoke Games. Hit me up with an email, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. You won the autographed Dave Robinson jersey. So, uh, with that being said, Tim, appreciate your time, buddy. We went way over, but I could talk ball with you all day, man. I really, really thank you so much for hopping on here. For those of you in the chat, thank you so much, especially uh, the Super Chats, Josh Martin. Appreciate you uh, hopping in here, man, and uh, and contributing to the show. It's funny, too. Every Super Chat, I think we disagreed with, but that's all right, man. That's what that's what makes the world go round, my man. Um, but, again, thanks to everybody. For those of you listening on the pod, thank you for making us a part of your day. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. And go back, go. taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on that's nice at caskers.com we make this experience easy caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne discover the top flavors of the year now by going to caskers.com and using code welcome 10 for ten dollars off your first purchase get ten dollars off your first purchase with code welcome 10 at caskers.com